primary enemy, Satan. Now, before Satan fell, who was the highest power in heaven? Satan. Under the now, God, Father, God, before the Son, Satan God, fell, God. who was the next most powerful person? Lucifer. Ella White writes in uh, Desire of uh, the Faith I Live By, who page was the 66, paragraph highest two. Listen power in heaven. Writing about Lucifer, she said, God made him good and beautiful as near as possible. Now she needs to listen. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. The closest thing to God, whether God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, was Lucifer. Now, Ella White writes, all should understand that Satan was once an exalted being. His rebellion threw him out of heaven, but did not destroy his power or make him a beast. Now, when Daniel prayed, Daniel 9 and 10, for understanding, God sent Gabriel, who took Lucifer's place. Are you following me? Under the, now, God the most Father, powerful Jesus, angel Jesus, in heaven who now is the next most is powerful. Gabriel. Gabriel was held up by Satan for how long? 21 days. Now, God who made him in good the universe, and beautiful God, and can hold up the most powerful angel in heaven? Satan. Because Satan is still the most powerful being after God. Ah, you didn't hear what I said. Listen to... <laughs> I'm close to you. Satan is still the most powerful being in the universe after God. So Gabriel could not get past Satan. The Bible, Ella White writes, Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1081, 1083, Paragraph 1. Listen carefully. Bear in mind, it is only God that can hold an argument with Satan. Not Gabriel. Bear in mind that it is only God that can hold an argument with Satan. Now, if the high priest is limited, he's less than God. Are you listening to me? If the high priest is limited, he is less than God and a priest less than God cannot conquer Satan. He has to be more powerful than Satan and the only person more powerful than Satan is God. Only divine power can conquer Satan. The high priest cannot be limited. Now, let me say this. Jesus is God and man. As a man, he has limitations he has voluntarily took. In other words, he can't be everywhere at the same time. Notice I said he has voluntarily took. But as God, he is still all-powerful. Notice what the Bible says about Jesus in Hebrews 1 verse 3. Listen carefully. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by as the word of his power when he had by who himself being the brightness of his glory first our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high this purging of sins required his death and his return from death now the bible says in hebrews 2:14 that Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. In coming back from the dead, Jesus showed his power over Satan who had the power of death. You know, the Bible says many times the father raised Jesus. It is Jesus who raised himself. Jesus said in John chapter 2, destroy this body and in three days I will raise it up. He had to come back to demonstrate he had total power over Satan. The high priest is without limit. A limited savior cannot save you. Whoever that minister is, may God correct him, but he's wrong. Okay, Pastor. There are some questions regarding salvation by works, and I would like to um, combine all of those in just one question, would I be saved if I'm not a vegetarian? Would I be saved if I cook on Sabbath? Would I be saved if I cook for those who are needy? <laughs> okay. 
If I cook on Sabbath, well, let me come closer. Will I be saved? If you read Exodus 16, verse 26 to 30, God told the Israelites, Seeth what ye shall seeth today. Cook on the preparation day, because tomorrow, the next day, is the Sabbath. Ellen White tells us there is to be no cooking on Sabbath. But the Bible said that. She does say, you may warm the food. No cooking on Sabbath. Now, <laughs> the question is, will I go to heaven or hell if I cook on Sabbath? People are lost for disobeying God. We are lost for disobeying God. God told the Israelites, the food you prepare on Friday will remain fresh on Sabbath because there's to be no cooking on Sabbath and the food remain fresh. God is the same. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Can he keep your food fresh on Sabbath if you're cooking on Friday? Yes. There's to be no cooking on Sabbath. Next question. How about being vegetarian? Would I be saved if I'm not a vegetarian? Or, <laughs> will I be saved if I'm not a vegetarian? You will be saved if you ignore God's conviction regarding your health habits. If God has given you light that meat is harmful, you continue to eat it, you have condemned yourself. Are you with me? You, here's what John 3.19 says. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. Now, has the world received light regarding diet, yes or no? Yes. You talk to any medical association, the Heart Association, the Cancer Association, they, in their recommendations for diet, they tell you either cut out meat or reduce it drastically. Because meat was not originally God's plan for us. Genesis 1.29 and God said, Behold, I have given, given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Even for the animals, they were to eat vegetarian a meal. Now, Ellen White writes, I don't recall where, God allowed sinners to eat meat to shorten their lives. Mm -hmm. He allowed them to eat meat to shorten their lives. Let me ask you this. If you plant a seed in the ground, after a few days, what happens? It grows. If you plant a chicken leg in the ground, <laughs> after a few days, what happens? Nothing. Worms. Now, when we plant things in our stomach, hmm? You plant seeds, they release life. You plant dead flesh, nothing. It was never God's will that we eat meat. God's preferences a vegetarian diet. And if he convicts you and you resist the conviction, you have condemned yourself. Not God. You. By your choice. Next question. Uh, has something to do with food again. Uh, this is the last about food, brethren. Uh, no more question to uh, get in because there is, are too many. Um, accidentally, I ate pork. Is it a sin or not? <laughs> you mean accidentally you ate and pork? Then, All right. Then no, I that's know, not a sin. Yeah. That's then, not a sin. Acts 17.30 the times of this ignorance, God winks at. Mm -hmm. When you don't know, God, does not, God is so merciful. When you don't know, he does not condemn you. But he arranges circumstances to bring the light of your error to your knowledge. Because even though you did it ignorantly, it was still wrong. I didn't say that clearly. Let me say it differently. An ignorant sin is still a sin. And it does damage. But God does not condemn you because you don't know. Listen to me again. An ignorant sin is still a sin. Okay. But God in his mercy does not condemn the ignorant person. But it is still a sin and it will hurt you. If you smoke not knowing it is wrong. 
it will damage your lungs. Now, God won't condemn you because you don't know, but your lungs are still damaged. Okay. And when you come to Christ, you may have to have a lung removed, but you're forgiven. Sin, ignorant, or willful is still sin. But if you ate that pork really ignorantly, God does not condemn you. But now that you know, still tell him you're sorry. There's nothing wrong with confession. Okay, the next question, follow up to that is, if I'm given a abominable food, let's say pork, is it okay to give it away to my neighbor? <laughs> All right, if I'm given an abominable food like pork. Yeah. Uh, pork's not the only abominable food, but we keep picking on pork. Okay. If it's bad for you, it's bad for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. If God can fix you, take off your jewelry, don't give it to your neighbor. Are you with me? Do what Jacob did when his people took off their jewelry. They buried it under the tree. Get rid of it somehow. If it's sinful, it is sinful no matter who puts it on. Or no matter who eats it. So if someone gives you pork, you can't eat it. Don't give it to someone so the person does wrong. Get rid of it somehow. Okay. Um, this is a very relevant question uh -huh. to all of us. I had been baptized, but I keep on sinning. You keep on sinning? Uh -huh. Yeah, like drinking. Mm -hmm. Because as he, I don't know if he's a boy or a girl, but All right. he feels so high, uh, socially high with somebody else who are drinking. Uh -huh. That's why he could not resist the uh, act of mm -hmm. that sin. Or so drinking. I've been baptized, I keep drinking and mm -hmm. whatever else. Mm -hmm. All right. Baptism is an outward symbol of death to a past life. Notice I said death, not a coma. You know what a coma is? You know what unconsciousness is? A lot of people are baptized in a state of unconsciousness, not death. You must be dead to your past life. That's why you are buried. Are you with me? The life must be given entirely to God. When that happens, God accepts that life as his own and he has the legal right to work in your life many of us we surrender ourselves to god partially going down in a baptismal pool getting wet does not change your life it is the change that occurs in your heart and so for this person if you're still drinking and smoking and whatever you're doing you need to re-examine your surrender to god you read the New Testament, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, with all thy might. You also find it in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 6. It must be total surrender. Now, even with a total surrender, you are growing and you will slip. But sin will not be a lifestyle. If sin is still a lifestyle, you have to review, was I truly surrendered to God? Because the Bible says, all things are passed away, all things are become new. Okay. These two questions are about second coming of Christ. Uh, the first question is saying that, why are the Seventh-day Adventists are believing on the second coming of Christ? I wonder if that's a Seventh-day Adventist who asked that question. Why do we believe in the second coming of Christ? It is the most popular doctrine in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. The second coming of Christ is hinted at all the way in Genesis 3.15. And I will put, and let me pray again. Father, please continue to give me wisdom, dear God. Please, before I rush off in my old carnal way, give me wisdom, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is the first mention of the gospel on the earth. It also includes the second coming of Christ. And you say to me, how do you say that? Go to Romans chapter 16. Quickly. Romans 16. Romans 16, the question was, why do Adventists preach about the second coming? If there's no second coming, there's no point. For all this church and 
vegetarian lifestyle and following Jesus and there's no second coming. Why did Christ die? Waste of time. The second coming is part of the overall atonement of Jesus Christ. Do you have Romans 16, verse 20? If you have my version, read it for me. What does verse 20 say? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your heel or feet shortly. Now, what does that sound like? Genesis 3.15. Now, Paul is writing this after Jesus went back to heaven. Are you with me? And he's saying, now the Lord of this shall or will. There is a future crushing of the head that still has to occur. At Calvary, the head was crushed, yes. But I'm told if you kill a cockroach for many hours, it's still alive. Satan is the greatest cockroach in the history of the world. So he's still alive, you see. Christ is coming back to finish him off. That's the second coming. The Lord of peace will bruise Satan under your feet. We will be part of that final blow that puts an end to Satan. We must preach the second coming. Let me tell you something about the second coming also. Jesus died to deliver us from the power of sin. That power that leads us to drink and curse and smoke and covet and whatever else. He died to deliver us from the penalty of sin, which is death. He also died to deliver us from the presence of sin. Even though you're converted, you're living a sinless life, all around you, you see sin. That has to be dealt with. And so the entire work of atonement will not end until the end of the thousand years when this world is made all over, Satan destroyed, all sin is destroyed, and a brand new world starts. That marks the end. Just the way Azazel, when he was cast out into the wilderness, marked the end of the day of atonement. We must preach the second coming of Christ. Or, uh, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's another reason why Jesus has to come back. Follow me closely. God does not lie. Titus 1 verse 2 Numbers 23, 19. Jesus says, I am truth. John 14, 6. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. The Father is truth. 1 John 5, 6. The Holy Ghost is truth. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are all truth. They don't lie. Now, Jesus said, I'm coming back. But long before Jesus said that on earth, he told Abraham he would give him the land of Canaan. Am I right? Yes or no? Yes. Go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Hundreds and hundreds of years passed. God told Abraham, you and your seed will inherit this land. Go to Hebrews 11. Let's read verse 13. If you have my version, read for me. What does that say? These all died in faith, meaning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. These all died in faith, come on, not having received the promise but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now Abraham died. When Abraham died, did he possess the land of Canaan? Yes or no? No. Did God tell him he'd have it? Yes. Did Abraham die without receiving that land? Yes. Did God lie? No. So what does God have to do? Come back and raise him up to keep his word. Ah, you all missed it. You missed it. You had a good meal, so you're sleeping. Okay. God told Abraham, I'll give you this lamb. When Abraham had to bury Sarah, you know what he had to do? Buy a cave because the land was not his. He had to buy a cave from the, the, the Hittites. God has to come back. Raise up Abraham in order to keep his word. That also tells us another very, very lovely story about God. Not even death can keep God's word from being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Not even death. God will raise you from the death to keep his word. Okay, he Pastor. must come back. We preach the second coming. The next question is about just provide the text 
uh, to answer the question, who shall come? Is it the Father or the Son? Yeah, in the second coming. The Bible says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and hold the holy angels with him. Now, when Jesus came down on Sinai, the Father and the Son came. And L. White is very clear. Both came down on Sinai, but it was Jesus that did all the speaking. When Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation 8 verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about a space of half an hour. Why is there silence in heaven? Everybody is coming. <laughs> now keep in mind, the most precious beings in the world to Christ are the sinners he saved. You didn't hear what I said. Are the angels in heaven who never sinned? Are there angels in heaven that have never sinned? Yes. We are closer to Christ than they are. The most precious possession Christ has is us. When he comes for us, everybody is coming. <laughs> Don't miss it. Do not miss it. Next question. Yes, Pastor, I have a question uh, asking some advice. Now, as we know, there are a number of people in our church that are following this idea that the Holy Spirit is not God. Yes, 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 yes. Now, when we find out that one of our fellow ministers has this kind of idea, uh -huh. how should we deal with it? After you well, talk to okay. them and then they, say, and then they, they refuse, uh -huh. and yet still they continue to okay. serve in the church, right. what should we do? Okay. It's a serious problem, my brother. Um, uh, Matthew 18 gives us how to deal with someone who offends you. You go to the person one-on-one. -on -one. There's no result, you take someone with you. There's no result, you go to the church. Now, you cannot throw out a minister. The conference has to do that. You take the steps the Bible lays out. You go to the elders, ask the elders to speak to the pastor. If there's no success, you let the pastor know we have to go to the conference. Do nothing behind his back. That's not the way God functions. But to deny the Holy Spirit is a serious crime. The Bible says, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. Whosoever therefore shall speak a word against the Son of God, it shall be forgiven him. But whoso speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. 32, yes. If that minister is preaching the Holy Spirit is not divine, is less than a, a, a divine being, someone needs to talk to him. Because if you believe the Holy Spirit is less than, then you are in spiritual trouble. It is because of the Holy Spirit in your life that you and I are able to resist the attacks of the enemy. Listen to what L. White writes. In uh, Evangelism, page 617, paragraph 2, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. You didn't hear what I said. The prince of the power of darkness or evil, who is that? Satan can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Now, she also writes in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 341, paragraph 1, God alone can limit the power of Satan. She writes in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 448, paragraph 2, Jesus can limit the power of Satan. You put those three quotations together, only Father, Son, and Holy Ghost can control the devil. All three. All three. It is dangerous to lower the Holy Spirit. Dangerous. Let me, uh, let me talk about the Holy Spirit some more. I like to talk about the Holy Spirit. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. If you don't believe the Holy Spirit is divine, just keep it to yourself. Don't corrupt other people, please. 1 Corinthians 2, do you have that? Let me pray. Father, as I deal with this most important subject, 
Give me simple language, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Read verse 9. Uh huh. I have not seen, nor ear, nor ear heard, heard, neither have, neither have entered, entered into the heart, heart of man, of man the, the things which God, God has prepared for, for them, them that love him. Now, carefully, next verse. But uh -huh. God, has God has revealed them unto us how? By his, his spirit. spirit. Keep on reading. For the, for the spirit, spirit searcheth all things, yea, yeah, the, the deep, deep things, things of God. God. Stop. Now, listen to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. The, the, he, the Greek word searcheth means to understand to a very deep level. Just to understand completely. Now, the spirit searcheth, understands how many things? All things. But what all things are these? The deep things of God. You know what that means? Everything God knows. Finish my words. The Holy Spirit knows you have to be God. Only someone equal with God can know everything God knows. Now, let's go to John chapter 3. John 3. Let's read verse 8. Very familiar verse. You have that? Anybody read nice and loud? Well, go ahead, my brother. The wind bloweth, where it listeth, uh-huh. And thou heareth the sound thereof, canst but not canst tell? not tell whence, whence it cometh it? and whither it goeth. Go ahead, finish carefully now. So, so is, is everyone that, that is born, born of, the, of spirit. the Spirit. Now, what do you understand by born of the Spirit? What is that? The new birth. Give me another word. Conversion. Give me another word. Justification. It is done by the Spirit. Now, go to Isaiah 45. If the Spirit is the one who does that, Isaiah 45, read verse 22. Isaiah 45. Well, someone else beside my handsome brother should be looking for it. Read, my brother. Pastor, here's our faithful brother to read. Look unto me. Look unto me and be ye saved. All, all the ends of the earth. For, for I, am, I am God and, and there, there is, is none else. According to that verse, who saves? God. God. Yes. According to John 3, 8 from the lips of Jesus, who converts? The, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The Holy Spirit must be God. God. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's very clear. All right. Let's that go. God is I mean, the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, now, this is a related question to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Please explain the two reigns. What's that? The two reigns, the first and the last reign, the early and the latter uh, reign yes, yes, of yes, the Holy yes. Spirit. Uh -huh. What about it? Uh, the, explain. Oh, the, oh, 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 oh. Uh, In the Old Testament, the Jews had the early reign to get the crop to grow and the latter reign to ripen it to maturity. Are you following me? Rain so it can spring up. Rain to bring it ready for harvest. The spiritual application of that is that we are God's harvest. We are God's crop growing in Christ. We receive the Holy Ghost to get us growing, but God will pour out the latter rain so that this work of the gospel may be completed by those who have grown and benefited from the early rain. Let me say that again. Those who have benefited from the early rain and have been faithful in what they know will receive the latter rain, which is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which will result in powerful preaching and miracles performed. At Pentecost, that was not the latter rain. That was the early rain. But it gives us an idea of what will it, it will be like when the latter rain falls. You know the powerful work those apostles did under the power of the early rain, which is the Holy Ghost. The latter rain is the same Holy Ghost, but greater power because now the entire work will be brought to an end. But only those who have taken hold of the early rain by living obediently to God will receive the latter rain. And let me tell you, some people are receiving the latter rain individually before it is poured out on the church as a body. Even as some people's probation close every day before there's a global close of probation. Ellen White writes, by the way, every day, every hour, someone's probation is closing. And if that doesn't make you somber and solemn and think, I don't know what will. Yes, Pastor. 
So, I don't know if this is the finale question, but the question goes like this. As is the A, what are the doctrines and Bible texts that we should know by heart? <laughs> That's a good question. When I, was yeah. a, when I became an Adventist, when I was a little boy, long ago, we were given Bible verses to memorize. We call them Adventist verses. Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 22, 12 and 14. Uh, did I say Revelation 12, 17? Revelation 18, 1 to 5. You had to know John 14, 1 to 3. Um, Isaiah 8, verse 20. We were given several Bible verses that we just had to know plus some quotations from Ellen White. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. All these quotations we had to learn. And so those are some of the Bible verses that were given to us. Plus, of course, Daniel 8.14, we had to know how to explain the 23. And I remember going through it date by date, fact by fact. Practicing how to explain the 2300. By the way, that's what Jehovah's Witnesses do. They assemble in their churches and they are taught, they are drilled how to present what they believe. We don't. And so our people are just tossed over because they cannot defend the basic teachings of this church. By the way, I have a question of my own. What are the five foundational teachings of this church? We call them the pillar of the church. What are they? The Sabbath, they all start with S. The Sabbath, the sanctuary, second, second coming, state of the dead. spirit of prophecy, state of the dead. Those are the five. We call them the pillars. Know how to defend them if you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Study them. Let me say something else. There is a very simple book, and I wanted to recommend it to my good brother Joseph. It's called Bible Readings for the Home. It is laid out just like the Catholic catechism. Question, answer. The Catholics know how to teach their people. Question, answer, question, answer. This book has the same style. Question, answer. It is simple. You study it like a textbook, you'll be able to defend truth. Find it, get it. Bible readings for the home. All the subjects you want that we believe. That the Bible teaches. It's not just we believe. The Bible teaches them. All right, next question. Okay, these are the last three different questions. The first is, where will God put his kingdom in the last day? Say that again. Where will God put his kingdom in the last day? Where will God or put where, his... where will God establish his kingdom? Where will in, he establish his kingdom in the last, in the days. last days? Now, yeah. when Jesus stood before Pilate in John 18, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered unto you. But now is my kingdom not from hence. The kingdom of God physically is not of this world. Spiritually, it's in us. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Listen to me carefully. There was a time when the kingdom of God was on the earth in the nation of Israel. When the last Israelite king was destroyed, I think it was Zedekiah, God no longer had a kingdom on the earth. So Jesus says, the kingdom of God is within you. Christ says, my kingdom is coming. He told Pilate, it's not of this earth. When he comes, he will reestablish a physical kingdom. But for now, the kingdom of God dwells in us when the principles of the kingdom are in our hearts and lives. The principles of the kingdom, which are the ten commandments of God. Okay. When God called the Israelites out of Egypt, he only gave them the Ten Commandments. That's all he wanted. Because of disobedience and weakness, he gave them everything else. A lot of other things. Listen to what Ellen White writes. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, paragraph 2. Listen very carefully. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah, unobserved by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the, the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant 
of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, neither would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be engraved on the tables of stone or proclaimed from Mount Sinai. And if the people had kept the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need for the other directions given to Moses. All God wants from us, really, is the Ten Commandments in our lives as living principles of love. All right, Pastor. Okay. Another question, uh, Pastor, which is very common is, uh, every time a person died, they would always say, my father or my mother is already in heaven. Uh -huh. Even Adventists would post on Facebook telling them that uh, my father just went to heaven mm -hmm. because they're dead. Uh -huh. So how do we enlighten well, them? Well, that's one of the cardinal teachings of the church. Dead people are in the grave. I... <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let me be patient. It's a virtue. Go to Genesis 2, please. Genesis 2. Do you have a little pulpit? I can put my, there's no little pulpit right here. I can put my Bible on. No, no, no. Can I have that chair, please? And God bless you for your decision. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All right. Do we have Genesis 2? Let me pray. Father, I'm discussing where people go after death. This was the devil. This continues to be one of the false doctrines the devil uses to deceive the whole world. Give me a simple explanation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 2, let's read verse 7. What does that say? And the Lord God, formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. Now, from what was Adam made? The dust of the ground. Is that clear? Go to verse 19. Read with me. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature. That was the name thereof. Salamat, salamat. My good brother, God bless you. Thank you so much. You're a good man. All right. Question for you. From what was Adam made? From what were the animals made? Dust. Okay, are you with me? Dust. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 19. Listen very carefully if you're Seventh-day Adventist. Even if you're not, listen carefully. Ecclesiastes 3, reading verse 19. Read with me. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Beast. Stop. What does the word befalleth mean? To happen what to. Happens. The Bible says what happens to us happens to animals. Keep reading. Even, Even one, one thing, thing befalleth, befalleth them. them. The same thing. Keep reading. As, As the, the one dieth, died, so the dieth the other. Dead. Stop. At the physical level, we die... The way animals die. The Bible says it's one death. Read the next statement carefully. Yea, they, they have, have all, all one, one breath. breath. <laughs> the breath of life in me is the breath of life in a dog. I said at the physical level. Yes. Are you following me? Amen. Finish the verse now. So, so that, that a man, man has hath no, no preeminence, preeminence above, above a beast. beast. If you go to a cemetery for pets and you dig up one of the graves, what will you find? Come on, dust and bones. If you dig up a cemetery for human beings, what will you find? Dust and bones. Because the Bible says they have the same flesh, they have the same breath, they die the same way. Now, verse 20. All go unto one place. Come on. All out of the dust. All turn to dust again. Now, what's so difficult about that? What does the Bible say? All go where? One place. Where's that? Mm -hmm. Now, 
this is the root of the truth of where the dead go when they die. If you say a dead man goes to heaven, you also have to say his dead dog goes with him. Because the Bible says they go where? The same place. Read verse 21 now, carefully. Who knoweth the spirit of man that it goeth upward and the spirit of it goeth? How can you say, the Bible says, a man at death goes up and an animal goes down? How can you say that, the Bible says? They go the same place. Now, there is a reason for that, and we find it, of course, in the first three chapters of Genesis. Go to Genesis 3. We're looking at the root of this teaching, Genesis 3. Do you have Genesis 3? Let's read from verse 17. Adam has sinned, following his wife. God deals with a wife in verse 16. Now he talks to Adam. Is everyone listening? Verse 17, read with me. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Keep reading. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Keep reading. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Come on. Till thou what? Return unto the ground. Keep reading. For out of it was thou taken. Keep reading. For dust thou art and unto dust shall thou return. Now, think with me. When God is talking to Adam, is Adam alive, yes or no? Yes. But what does God call him? What does God call him? Look at verse 19. Dust. He calls him dust. Now, verse 7 says of chapter 2, just listen. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Listen to me carefully. Adam was not made from dust and breath. He was made from dust. The breath brought the dust to life. Listen to me again. Adam was made from dust. So when God is talking to him, God doesn't say, dust and breath thou art. He just says, dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, we have a principle. It is called the principle of return. Now, how could God tell Adam, till thou return unto the dust? How can God say that? Now, tomorrow, I am returning to the United States. That's where I came from. How many of you have ever been to Bangladesh? Can I see your hand? Bangladesh. I have been there. So I can return. Are you following me? I can return. Why does God tell Adam, until thou return unto the ground? What does he mean by that? That's where you came from. And when you die, finish my words. That's where you go. Now, God made Adam from dust. Where did God find the dust? On the earth. Where did the breath come from? Uh-huh. Why could Adam not go back to heaven or go to heaven? That's not where you're rich. That's not where he came from. There's no dust in heaven. He came from the dust. Now, if he had been made of breath, ah, he could have gone back. No, he was made from dirt, so he has to go back. Are you following me? Yes. Go to uh, Genesis 18. Listen to Abraham. Genesis 18. We read from verse 25. Genesis 18, reading from verse 25. Do you have that? Let me pray. Father in heaven, I am still explaining this very, very vital subject. Speak through me, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read for me. What does that say? That be far from thee. To what? Destroy to do after this manner, to destroy the wicked, the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. Abraham is telling God, you cannot destroy the righteous with the wicked. That be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And the Lord said, 
If I fight in Sodom 45, I will do what? I will not destroy it. Verse 27, read for me. And Abraham answered the Lord and said, What? Behold, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Now, how does he describe himself? Which am but dust and ashes. That's all I am. He does not say, I am dust and breath. Go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I hope you're listening. I really do. Psalm 103. Do you have that? Let's read verse 14. Let's read 13 and 14. Are you there? Read with me. Like as a father, father pitieth his, his children. children. Come on. So, so the Lord, Lord pitieth them, them that, that fear, fear him. him. Now read verse 14 carefully. For, For he, he knoweth our, our frame. frame. In other words, how we were made. He remembereth that we are dust. We're dust. Not that we're dust and breath. So over and over we read, we are dust. And God's principle is you go back to where you came from. Now, no matter what you read in Luke about Lazarus and the rich man, you have to stick with this foundation, which is the dead go back to where they came from. Luke cannot preach something different from that. I said all of that to say, any Adventist will know, when you die, you're in the grave, just like Jesus. The Bible says David is not ascended into heaven. His sepulcher is still with us. He's in the grave. If you were in heaven, there was no need for Christ to come back. Are you following me? To raise the dead because they're already alive. It is, there are two doctrines, false. The devil uses to deceive most of the world. Doctrine one, the first day of the week is holy. Doctrine two, dead people are not really dead. Two, he uses to deceive the whole world. Next question. <coughs> when do I stop? Yeah, Pastor. That's my question. <laughs> when do I stop? Um, I don't know. If All right. We the talking gets you tired. All right, eh? go ahead. We started at uh, about 2.30. It's 10 to 4. We stop at 4 o'clock. 10 more minutes. Uh, yes, 10 Pastor. 10 more minutes. Mm -hmm. But these four questions are not related with each other. So, I don't know, Pastor, if the 10 minutes would suffice to give us the comfort that if we do not know the answer, we might be saved. Okay, what's the, answer? What's the question? What I mean is, whether we answer it or not, uh -huh. whether we may know the answer or that we may not know the answer, we can still be saved. <laughs> uh, there are still four questions that are not related. That I'm, I think okay, 10 minutes would not suffice. Let me have one of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is said that Enoch, Elijah, and Moses had been to heaven, yes. but the Bible, some parts of the Bible is saying that nobody gets into heaven. So how would you like to uh, make it The Bible congruent? says no one has gone to heaven? Uh, Moses, Elijah, uh -huh. and Enoch, yes. they are all in heaven. But there are some part uh, of the Bible, text that is saying that nobody had been into heaven. Go to John 3. Okay. John 3. I don't understand. Well, let me not say that. Let me, not, let me just answer the question and forget what I don't understand. John 3. Let's read verse 12 of John 3. Let's read from 11 of John 3. We have 10 minutes left. <laughs> Questions keep coming. <laughs> okay, give the mic to my brother. Okay. We're reading John 3 from verse 11. Verily, verily, I say, say unto you, thee, we speak that we do know, that's and right. testify that we have seen. Aha, uh -huh, this is Jesus is saying, I'm and talking ye, about what I know, what I've seen. Keep and, reading. And ye receive not our witness. That's right. Meaning Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, whomever. He is saying, I am telling you what I have seen, and you don't believe me. Now, keep reading. If I, if I have told you earthly, earthly things, things uh -huh. and ye believe not, yes, how, how shall, shall ye believe, believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Now, pause. Jesus is saying, if I tell you about things on the earth where you live and you don't believe me, how will you believe me if I tell you about things in heaven? Keep reading now. And no man... Uh-huh. But he that came down from heaven... Ah... 
Eden. That's the clue. He that came down. What Jesus is saying, no one has gone up and come down to report. Yes. The Son of Man originated in heaven. Well, not originated. That's his home. He has come down. But when Elijah went up, he didn't come down and tell the people what he saw. When Moses went up, he did not come down and tell the people what he saw. When, uh, who's the other fellow? Enoch went up, he did not come down. So what the Bible means, no one has gone up and come down to report. But Jesus has come down to report. Amen. Mm. You must read the Bible microscopically. Well said, Pastor. Mm. All right, <clears throat> next question. Uh, when Adam and Eve ate that forbidden fruit, how come that they did not die immediately? No, they didn't. Why didn't they die immediately? Mm -hmm. The Bible says there is a mediator between God and man. The instant, now, Revelation 13, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In a very, well, I don't want to say strange, but in a very remarkable way, even before Jesus shed his blood, his blood was effective by faith. It is because he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that Adam and Eve were not killed immediately. As soon as they sinned, Jesus stepped in as a mediator. And his blood saved them. He actually died 4,000 years later, but Christ is the lamb. The blood of Christ is what covered Adam and Eve by faith. It is the blood of Christ that covered Abraham and Noah and Enoch and Adam. There's only one way to be saved. The blood of Jesus. When he came to the earth, he actually shed the blood physically, but by faith, his blood was effective way back. Mm-hmm. Because no one can be saved without the blood of Jesus Christ, which represents his life. Next question, Pastor. Um, I think this is very, um, this is the nail to the coffin okay. question. <laughs> okay. And this is very relevant to all of us. Mm -hmm. Why did David was called the man after God's own heart, despite his sins of murder and adultery? Say it again. Why? Why did David was called the man after, his, uh, after God's, God's own heart? Yes. Despite even, of his sins, uh -huh. adultery and murder. Yes. <laughs> uh, make it relevant to all of us. Say it again. Make it relevant to all of oh, us. <laughs> yeah. That's right. If you listen to some Adventists talk about David, you would think David's whole life, all he did was commit adultery and commit murder. You know, the Bible actually says that David offended God in his affair with Bathsheba. That's the thing the Bible identifies as David's big mistake. David's life was not a life of disobedience to God. There are other verses that say that Solomon did not obey David. His heart was not perfect with God, as was the heart of his father David. And when David realized he was wrong, what did he do? He repented. He was broken. But David's life was not a life of adultery and fornication. It was a life of warfare. But not adultery and murder, no. He made that mistake, yes. It was a double mistake in the same event. God forgave him. He paid his price. He loved God more than anything else. He was a man after God's own heart. He loved God more than he loved himself. Solomon built the tabernacle, but David gathered all the materials. He just wanted to give God everything he could. Read the Psalms and see how much David loved God. He made a big mistake. Moses loved God. He made one big mistake. Uh, just before entering Canaan, the Lord said, go up to that mountain and die. David was a man after God's own heart. Abraham was called the friend of God, and he committed adultery with Hagar. But you can't, there's a difference between a sin and a life of sin. Are you with me? Now you're not with me. There is a difference between a sin and a life of sin. As you grow in Christ, you'll make mistakes. But your mistakes will become fewer and fewer and fewer. And you won't keep making the same mistake. David was a man. Jesus will sit on the throne of his father, David, when he comes. And if we can live a life like David, we'll be living powerful lives. All right. 
It's four o'clock on the dot. Let me thank you for your questions. Let me urge you as your brother. Please. How do you say please in Tagalog? Huh? What? Well, that's too long. Okay. Please. <laughs> please. What am I about to say? I'm holding the Bible and I'm saying, please, what am I about to say? Read your Bible. Study it. For God's sake, study your Bible. Learn about Jesus for yourself. When you stand in the judgment, you cannot tell God the pastor did not preach good sermons. God holds you responsible for knowing this. Why? Jesus said in John 16, 13, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit is sent to us to teach those who are trying, but remember what Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Finish the promise. They shall be filled. Do you hunger and thirst after Bible knowledge? Don't answer me. Do you hunger and thirst for a knowledge of God's word? The possible answer is no. Are you a nice person? Yes. Are you decent? Yes. Do you love the church? Yes. Are you a vegetarian? Maybe. Do you hunger and thirst for the word of God? No. A person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness will spend time in this. You're not saved by being decent, although all saved people will be decent. You are saved by allowing the word of God to work in your life. And you have to know it in order to know Jesus. You cannot know Jesus if you don't know the Bible. You can know about Jesus. Every atheist knows about Jesus. But to know Jesus, you've got to study the word of God. I plead with you, make time for God's word Please, let's stand and pray. Before I pray, any prayer requests? Just raise your hand. Dr. Jim. Yes, pray for the newly baptized members. The devil will try to turn them around. We have to pray and pray and pray without ceasing. Someone else, prayer request. Yes, my brother. Your, brothers, your mother and sister to give their lives to Christ and walk in the truth. And the truth itself is light. Okay. And life. Pray for those who are a blessing to us in so many ways. Yes. And many people have been a blessing to me. And I pray for them every day. My commitment is to pray for them until Jesus comes when they no longer need prayer. Prayer request. Yes, Pastor. The elder of the church is sick. Anastasio. Anastasio. Well, God knows the whole name. It's okay. Anastasio, he is sick. The elder of which church? Okay. Or in the now. All right. Anastasio is sick. He's the leader of the church. All right. Pray for him. Someone else. Prayer request. Yes. Pray for what? Church building. Okay, all right. Church building. By the way, if the church building is not complete, you should not beautify your house. Take care of the church first. Then take care of your house. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to all of us. Listen to me carefully. You don't believe me. Read Haggai chapter 1. If God's church is incomplete, don't keep beautifying yours. Finish God's house. Then work on yours. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. Prayer request. Okay. Oh, yes. What she say? Oh, yes. Pray for the students who are here. Their studies, God will provide their needs. Bless their parents to keep providing for them. Keep them upright. And the leaders of AUP. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Those with an interest in Bible study, pray for them. Yes. I have a request. Pray for me. 
Anytime I come across your mind, just say, Lord, wherever that man is, put your words in his mouth. And I mean that very, very seriously. Did I see your hand? Your education. We need tuition, okay. Tuition. And all students can identify with that. Tuition. Mm -hmm. Haggai chapter 2 verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. Psalm 24 verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Anything else? All right, let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this question and answer session. I hope I spoke your words. I tried. I hope your sons, your daughters learn something, dear God. I hope they will leave this place with a renewed determination to study your word and to know it for themselves, God. Let your word be more vital to them than food. As Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. As Jeremiah said, thy words were found and I did eat them. As Jesus said, I have meat to eat, ye know not of. Lord, give us a love for your word. Because as your word dwells in us, it removes our interest in the world. Remember all the prayer requests that were offered for tuition. A pastor, an elder who's sick, a church building, education, family members outside the church. Whatever the request is, they God. You are a generous God. You're not willing that any should perish. You give lavishly because the entire universe is yours. Answer us in the areas of our need, Father. A double blessing on the students. Help them to figure out clearly how they will use the education for your glory. Bless AUP. Let the leaders administer the school so that it becomes a light to this community and leads many people to Christ. Continue to use me wherever I go. Bless the Philippines. Bless every country represented by this congregation. Dear God, when you come, save all of us without losing one, along with those for whom we have labored. I pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Pastor Riskit. Uh, in behalf of South Central Luzon Conference, the president of the South Central Luzon Conference is conveying his gratitude for your presence. And also to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Jimmy. Okay, let us all rise for a closing song. Hello? Hello? Let's sing Over the Sunset Mountain. Do you know that song? Anybody who can play the piano? Over the sunset mountain, ready sing. Over the sunset mountain, someday I'll safely go into the arms of Jesus, he who hath loved me so. Over the sunset mountain, heaven awaits for me. Over the sunset mountain, Jesus my Savior I'll see. will soon be Shadows will flee away, sorrows will be forgotten. Oh, what a wonderful day over the sunset mountain. Heaven away. Jesus, my Savior, I'll see. Let's hop our heads. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, O God, and we praise you for your wonderful works that you have done to our lives. 
Thank you, O oh God, for enlightening us with your words. Thank you, O oh God, for using Pastor Randy to provide us your truths, to guide us, O oh God, that we may learn to have love for the Bible, for your truths. We pray, Lord, that each one of us, as we depart from this place, will have a new zeal and a desire to fully understand you and to, un to, and to read your words and to spend time knowing you, Lord, that when the time comes, we will all be ready to be with you there in that heavenly home which the was prepared for us. Heavenly Father, we ask for your holy angels that excel in strength to provide safety as we travel, as we go to our respective homes. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, continue to use us that even as we depart from this place, we can be witnesses, we can be disciples of yours wherever we go. We ask, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone and have a good day.